I have great honor in introducing Earl Mills Jr., known as Chiefy Mills. He, he's our first presenter. He's a University of Massachusetts Amherst and Stockbridge School of Agriculture, Plants and Soil Science alumni. As a student of traditional plant knowledge of the Wampanoag, he has been working to maintain plant diversity in the face of climate and habitat change. That's only a few things that Earl Mills does. He's a well-known historian. Um, he knows his culture in and out. He's an elder that most people around Mashpee look, and other communities look up to. So every word we, he speaks, I listen to and I learn from. So I'd like to welcome Earl Mills, Jr., Chiefy. Thank you, Darius. Um, my topic is plants, apparently. Um, I've, I've, I've brought some plants up here that at your leisure you can look at. They're, they're uh, some things that, are, that we use in our everyday life. Uh, witch hazel, there's some mint, a plant called Joe Pieweed, named after an Indian doctor, some uh, bone set, and some jewelweed, and some uh, flag root. Um, and these are, these are plants that you might find in any Indian household. There are herbalists that say that this is the, one of the most widely used among Indian families. Uh, not just Indians, but... But uh, th this is a part of our material culture of plants. And like a lot of our culture, it has been uh, distorted by uh, the dominant society. It suggested that our knowledge of plants and herbs is a, has been learned through trial and error. Uh, but that's not our understanding. In, in our uh, creation history, is that how we put it? The, the way that this land here, Turtle Island as we refer to it, was uh, created, there were entities that laid out and named all the plants. And as they were doing this, uh, because we live in a dichotomous uh, environment, there were two entities that started uh, laying out and naming plants. And the one entity, which would be kind of not, not the evil side, but the contrary side, started putting down plants that were, uh, uh, let's say, harmful to us. Things like uh, poison ivy, poison oak, uh, different, different things like that. But then the, the, uh, the other energy side, or the positive energy side, would lay down a plant or a medicine beside it to counteract that. So when, in our understanding of plant world, when there is a, a poison, there is the antidote nearby. And that's the balance of, of, of this, uh, this life, that uh, an underlying feature of our culture is, is to live in balance. And that is how we have, for thousands of years, uh, lived. This land, like Linda was alluding to, was, was viewed as a, a bountiful paradise by early Europeans. They saw huge groves of nut trees and, and you know, more, more birds than, than could be counted. These things were, were managed. Because back in the old days, we had, through our spiritual understanding, learned how to survive based on the things that were available. And we used our, our knowledge of the interaction of these things to manage them to their fullest potential. We have a story of how the, uh, the medicine knowledge was learned, and it's called the story of the bear. See, our, our whole foundation is spiritual understanding that when we were created, human beings were the last to be created. And the Creator had run out of things to instill in us as, as uh, what we call instinct. 
All the rest of creation was given instincts so that when they are born, they know how to survive. Well, human, human beings, as we know, do not have instincts. They have to learn as they go along. So we were told when we were created to learn from each of the relatives on earth. Each of the animals will teach you how to survive in this land. Using their instincts, we will, we will know how to survive. Well, an interesting thing about the bear is that it has a, a very uh, great knowledge of how to use plants to survive. They know about laxatives. They know about uh, uh, antibiotics. They know how to, how to address a wound when it happens to them. So there's a story that a person came into a village and was welcomed by a lady and as this person was visiting with her it, uh, it started taking on different ailments and then it, it instructed the lady how to uh, where to find a plant for medicine and how to utilize it and it, she eventually developed a whole, whole uh, resource of plant medicine and that became known as the bear clan And today, the Bear Clan people are the, are the medicine keepers. And so this, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, uh, a little chaotic here. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that this cultural knowledge is, is on par with science. And it is a, uh, a very complex and, and uh, yet well understood uh, cultural pattern. I'm, uh, I need to take a break here, but uh, am I making any sense right now? I feel like I'm getting a little off track. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about how we can use this in school. Okay, so our our life is based on the seasons. Our life in the Wampanoag way is based on the seasons. Spring is the beginning. Spring is a time of rebirth. And culturally, there are certain plants that we utilize in the spring. When we think of rebirth, we think of coming out of a long sleep or, or just starting anew. As the, uh, when the plants first start growing, they are at their most nutritious time. Well, we, we have what we call first foods. And that is a time when, coming out of wintertime, you have, literally, you have your first fresh food that's available. Prior to that, our people were living on things that were stored. So, it's the growing tips of plants that are both the most nutritious and have the most medicinal value. It is, uh, it is a time when we, we gather medicine that will cleanse our body, because in wintertime, for all animals, it's a hard time because uh, resources are, are at their least. So in our seasonal patterns, we have uh, spring tonics and it is a time that uh, we use, that we have learned from the bear. Again, when a bear comes out of hibernation, the first thing he does is he goes and has, a, has himself a nice laxative because he's bound himself up for the winter. And when, when, you're, when you're hunting bear in the spring, the spring bear coat is the softest, and so it's a time when, when our people are, are, are looking for our bear skin for clothing. We see that the bear 
you know, we watch that, and and uh, so we're looking at those new spring tips. We look at our our bodies, and we'll we'll look for a liver tonic, and. When, they, when the English came here, they marveled at the, at the health and vigor of our people. It's because we follow these seasonal patterns, watching the plants as they grow and utilizing them at different times. When we come out of the spring, we go into the summertime, and it's a time of flowering and fruiting. And it's a time for gathering. Like this, this plant here called Joe Pieweed, was used by a, a Anishinaabe medicine man to uh, to cure the pox. But we, we have many uses for this, and it is a time when, if you don't gather these things in the summertime, then you won't have them for the winter. Uh, th this one here, the, the bone set, the, they used to say that, boy, those Indians can really heal fast. It's because of, of our of our plant knowledge. It wasn't trial and error. It was it was sp spiritual understanding that we say that those those entities that put these plants here instructed us how to do these things. Science will tell you that this plant here is one of their strongest immune supportive plants in this environment. Our people didn't just coincidentally understand that. Our understanding of plant knowledge is comparable or superior to what science can tell you about the, the uses of plants. Science is only now starting to catch up to our old Indian knowledge when you have researchers that are discovering this kind of information about these plants that have been in use for thousands of years. When I was in school uh, studying agriculture, and one of my professors says, he's talking about fertilizers, and he said, somehow the Indians uh, stumbled on the fact that fish was one of the most efficient fertilizing ingredients that you, could, that you could ever find. But they must have thought that by putting the spirit of the fish into the ground, they were in, you know, uh, asking for the spirit of the corn to emerge, or some some such uh, mysticism. Our people are keen observers, and the science or cultural understanding that we have is not based on uh, any hocus pocus or any uh, ignorant uh, stumbling. It is a it is a uh, a true science and. We were told that this plant will protect us from evil, or what we call bad medicine. It'll protect you from evil spirits. Well, contrary to what the English thought, we are not devil worshippers. But for us, evil spirits are sickness. Sickness and ill health. Those are the most severe things that could affect a family because they could take away your children. As it turns out, this root is uh, extremely high in bioflavonoids and uh, antioxidants. And we, we, we chew this and we carry this with us, uh, having it always available. So, in fact, it does protect us from evil spirits. And it's not, uh, a lot of things that I used to hear as a child, I was thinking, oh, that's, that's Indian mysticism, you know, but the more I study, the more I learn, the more I realize that that whole Indian mysticism is an American uh, fallacy. Our Indian ways are something that has allowed us to survive for thousands of years. But in this, uh, in this society, we are made to, to feel embarrassed or ashamed of our, of our Indian ways because the, the foundation of America is that Indians are inherently in the way of everything. And to be feared and to be uh, reviled. Uh, I was at a powwow recently and 
there was a, a man with his young child, he was carrying him on his shoulders, and he says, uh, keep an eye out for these guys because one of them might come up and scalp you. And I thought that kind of, that kind of uh, conversation was you know, way in the past, that we had evolved a long way. But then I, I remembered that you know, the foundations of America is, is to get rid of us. Not that by Americans, but of America. You know, the, 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 like the state flag, it's got the Indian with a sword over his head because we are in the way of progress and advancement. And, you know, that, that is the core of, of the American way. And it is instilled in people in ways that, you know, don't go off the reservation, uh, which is a concept that because if, if our people strayed out of our own little community, there was a potential for death because it was not illegal to kill Indians. In fact, uh, we have a poster on the wall that shows two men carrying an Indian on a stick. And it, their, the quote is, I didn't know that it was wrong to kill Indians because all, up until about the 1990s, when was it Sammy helped pass that, uh, repeal that law in, the, United, in the, the Commonwealth? There was a bounty for the, the, the heads and later on they changed that to just the scalps of Indians paid by the great general court up on Beacon Hill there. It was only repealed in the 1990s, I believe it was. Um, and that's, but that's life as an Indian, you know? You watch out, they, but you know, it's us that Americans feared for taking the scalp, but it was countless Indian scalps that were paid for by the great general court, not the other way around. I'm not sure what that has to do with plants. <laughs> but it, uh, you know, it's that Indian mysticism thing. You know, that uh, somehow these Indian ways are, are to be, you know, you should be embarrassed about them. That why don't you just go to the store? We're all gathering sometime. And <laughs> this lady said to my cousin, why don't you just go to the store and get it, you know? Why do you get to come out here and, and you know, it, it uh, I mean, because you can buy witch hazel in the supermarket, right, it's right next to the rubbing alcohol. Uh, but the thing is, we have a relationship with this. When we, when we pick this, we do prayer and ceremony so that, that this plant will understand that it's our relative and that we, we're acknowledging that and so when we use this plant in our cultural way, we're, we're connecting with it. So that not only does, not only do the, uh, the chemical ingredients of this plant help to heal us, but those prayers that we have connected with the spirit of this plant, they're also helping to heal us. And science will confirm to you that this plant indeed does have what we call a spirit or e electrical energy that keeps it alive. That is what we refer to when we say spirit. That chemical energy that is in imbued in these plants by our creator, we recognize those things. It's a part of our culture and it's comparable to science, although many would uh, dispute that. So, enough of my ramblings. Uh, you're welcome afterwards to come up and look at any of these plants if you had questions about them. It's just a little smattering of the material culture that we have. You know, uh, our, our entire physical culture is based on plants, whether it's for baskets, for, for canteens, for, for uh, other water carrying devices. We could use plants that grow around us and uh, be able to do these things even though many of them are threatened by invasive plants. We, we have a plant here, jewelweed, but it's surrounded by some, some wild uh, morning glories that are choking it out. Uh, the wild morning glory is an invasive plant that comes in and can uh, displace the, the native plants. But that, that's, the, that's the habit of many things that come from Europe. They come here and have displaced the, the native inhabitants of the land. But uh, this too shall pass. Thank you.
We got our next, next presenter, George Chucky Green, is a Wampanoagan and has almost 30 years of conservation and environmental management experience. He served as the assistant director of the Natural Resource Department of the Mastery Wampanoag Tribe from 2008 to 2017 before taking on the role as director. What Chucky does now is a lot of consultant work with the environment with Massachusetts, and um, you'll learn quite a bit from this man. Well, thank you, Chucky. First of all, I've decided to come out here because I've watched people all day watching PowerPoints and then turning back to the <laughs> mic and then watch and then turn back. And so I wanted to get in a position where I could see everybody and, and speak to everybody. <clears throat> you said my name is George Chucky Green. I have retired this year from the Natural Resource Department of the tribe. I see faces that I know and I'm, I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to talking to you about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is the environment that we live in. Um, well, the Matthew Wampanoags have been here time immemorial. We actually date back 35,000 years. I hope I'm not speaking into the mic properly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> We date back close to 35,000 years. Um, we were located out at George's Banks before the sea level rise dropped 125 meters. Um, and then we moved this way. Oh, that's okay. I have one. I didn't bring it. Thank you, Darius. Well, One of the first things that I started doing when I became, when I joined the Natural Resource Department was to try to figure out how can we go back in time? How can we go back and utilize what we've learned as a tribe that has been here for that many centuries? How can we use what we know to make things a little better for everybody here? And I thought about my Uncle Pete. He was Mashpee's first fire chief. I never understood why he did some of the things he did, but in looking back, I've, since I've grown older and a little smarter, I, I've kind of figured him out. But we'd, we'd go and it was a whole volunteer force. So kids were sometimes used to move vehicles, get things into place. So I, wouldn't, I didn't understand, okay? Uncle Pete would circle a fire, but not go in and put it out. He'd wait, and the guys would show up, and they'd let the fire burn. They'd control the direction of the fire. They'd control where it was going. And he had broken up the woodland into a grid pattern that allowed him to do this and maintain. Well. As I grew older, I learned a little more. And I learned that prescribed fire was something that native tribes did from time immemorial to cultivate plants, to protect pathways, to open up environments so that they could actually see what they're hunting and see what they're searching for and be able to pass outside of the beaten path. So I said, okay, let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's use that tribal lands to go and find out what benefits we can reap from the practices of our tribal ancestors. So as a natural resources director, I applied for some funding and we started talking about prescribed burning. Well, I met such a clutter of angry folks talking about me going to cut down a tree and light a fire in the woods. Um, so I turned to one of those pilgrims, um, one of the Mortons as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, and he had quoted about how he had seen Native people doing burning twice a year wherever they went. 
So I said, okay, this needs a little bit more looking into, and then I can come to tribal council and throw it out there. Well, nobody was still up for the, for the let's go do it. But neither the fire chief in Mashpee either. Fire chief in Mashpee at that time said, you will never light a match in my woods. And I said, well, it's not your woods, so. <laughs> And we, we got to do that was George Baker. Well, we discovered in our first year of burning, we had revival of some plants that we hadn't seen before on this property. We had we found that by lighting the woods up, we could also lower lower the forest so that it could benefit the New England cottontail rabbits. So the cottontail rabbit turned to be our fun maker and everybody wanted to help them out. They could only eat six inches off of the ground. So by creation of an early successional forest, we could aid them. And they were a vital part of our history and like us indigenous. The only indigenous rabbit to this area is the New England cottontail. Other rabbits have been brought in to hunt, and to, but the only indigenous is the New England cottontail. So we got into prescribed burning. Chucky, uh, Chucky, I don't mean to interrupt you, but should we on, be on a certain slideshow show? Or are we still waiting? Is this your... Can't hear you. Can we, can we start your slideshow? Are we wait, waiting right now? Or? Yes. We can't wait a minute. Okay. okay. Just let us know when this can go. <laughs> See what happens? When I was a selectman, they used to do this too. They don't give him a mic because he'll just stop talking. <laughs> but I mean, uh, yeah, I was trying to lead into it, but yes, um, we can start the slideshow. <laughs> All right, in order to do prescribed burning, we needed to learn how to control what was going on. and. In doing that, we needed to train folks. The first two trained wildfire guys was were myself and Quan Toby. Um, we ended up being the first wildfire trained people in Mashpee, which was really surprising to me. None of the fire department knew anything about that. Next. I don't like the way they show up, but I think we can go to the next slide. It'll probably be a little better. Yeah, that's a little better. But by putting fire on the ground, what else we discovered is that it helped the blueberries and huckleberries and such to increase the harvest. And my kids at the camp, they love that because they say, okay, we're going to go into the fire areas. Next slide. Oh, there you go. That's a lot better. And we also had decided that, okay, as we move forward, we've got to build a fire force. Um, uh, that's all right. You get, didn't have to do that far, but that's okay. That's good. So we decided the Natural Resource Department needed to have some of its people trained as well so that we could contribute to the fire response and also the prescribed burning. We have one of our fire guys right at the back of the room. I guess he came down to listen. That's Dale Oakley. Um, we were able to certify several tribal residents to be our fire guys. Next. So we dealt with that question. Next was shellfish and water quality. Water is life to the Wampanoag people. It's n oh, you're a little ahead of me, but okay. <laughs> um, water is life to the Wampanoag people. 
And so we had problems. Our bays were all state listed impaired waterways. So we had to think of a way to address this in also a native way. We went to the scientists and said, okay, what do we do? And they're saying, well, there's no way. There's too much. It's too late. It's so we ended up talking to Dr. Brian Howes out of UMass Dartmouth. And he said, well, you ever thought about oysters? And we said, well, sounds like a good idea. Let's look at it. So we started looking at oysters, oyster culture to try to mitigate the nutrients in our embayments. So we brought in oysters. Everybody said, it's not going to work. Well, it actually did. The EPA gave the department the Environmental Merit Award for proving that we could reduce nutrients in the environment with oysters. And that's the way it would have been in our tribal towns because we would have had the shellfish in place to take up nutrients that weren't there yet because we were not that many people as we are now. But it was another way that our tribal history could speak to us and say, okay, we've got a problem. We didn't create the problem, but we can help fix the problem. So, I mean, that's where we went with that. We set a goal of 10 million oysters, which I'm no longer the director, so I don't know where we stand on that. But <laughs> But the goal, was, the goal was a good goal, and it's a good goal still, and oyster culture can, an oyster can filter eight gallons of water in an hour. Um, one of the things that I have my kids do over and over is put a 10 gallon tank up and about a half a dozen oysters, put them in that tank and visually watch them clear the water. Oh, here comes the good part. Slide. These are the two farms that we set up. Um, four and a half acres and an eight acre farm try to raise the oysters to clean the bay. Um, we've, gotten, we've gotten to the point that we're holding the line. We haven't, we haven't won the battle because development hasn't stopped and mitigation hasn't stopped. The reason we picked that the bay as our source, because this problem starts at um, well, this is Papanasa Bay. It starts at Mastery Wakey Lake. And it's like a 58 year run from the lake to the bay. So we felt to get the biggest bang for our buck to be able to demonstrate to people that this was actually working, that we needed to, instead of going to the faucet, we needed to go to the drain. And we've been able to show reduction not to a point that we're making real big headway, but to the point that we've got the town talking about um, sewage treatment, sewering, to try to reduce the Im impacts that are coming down the river. Next. That's Pancon Point. Gooseberry Island. That is where our oyster farm is located. Next. That's one of our tribal members working with the prior shellfish constable, Richard York. He, like me, is an old retired guy now, so. <laughs> um, but that's where we started. We started raising oysters in baskets and 
then we had a harvestable byproduct, which is very Cape Cod-like. Everybody likes it on okay. Cape. Well, it, it became a process of sorting and sizing and going forward that way. So it worked out really well. Next. Now this is my heart. This is my heart. I wish I had brought the film. <laughs> Cause this is my heart. This is part of the reason I ended up meeting Nicole. Who <laughs> we talked. Uh, when she was working when she was living right down from where I worked. <laughs> um, POH. Native Youth and Science Preserving Our Homelands. This is the part that relates to all you teachers. Um, our way of teaching to our children is twofold. It's, we take a scientific perspective. We work with scientists from USGS, from NOAA, from Woods Hole Oceanographic, um, and APHIS, and we try to develop a curriculum that is different than anything that they've had before. And that being that they'll have hands-on in doing each thing that we have to work on. Um, camp has been great success. Nine years this year was the finish of the ninth year. The last of my grandchildren have now participated in camp, so I'm safe with my retirement. Um, it's, it's the biggest pleasure in my life, but Mr. Mills, who you guys heard from earlier, has been a culture keeper alongside me for the whole nine years. And us being able to give the kids a tribal perspective has brought it along really well. When we first looked at doing the camp, it was about that our kids were losing touch with their ancestral knowledge and also the stories. When I grew up here in Mashby, we walked to the fire station, sat down and listened to the elders talk about the stories, about where, who we were. And then we'd walk down the yellow line because nobody wanted to get too close to the woods because we were all terrified by that point. And we'd all walk down the yellow line on our way home because at that time there weren't any street lights down on 130. <laughs> so we saw that that wasn't happening, that our kids were growing off of the path. They were growing into a culture that is electronic and not too much hands on. So what we wanted to do is give them an opportunity to go out in the environment and learn. Next. Well, part of that learning was that there are things that we can do that will actually save species for us that we need. Um, what you're looking at now is a pollinator garden that the kids planted on our tribal farm. The pollinator garden supports pollinators who if, are struggling right now to stay alive with all the invasive animals and plants. And so by building these pollinator gardens, we taught the kids that, you know, it's not always you can't do something. If you can do a little something, you might not be able to solve the whole problem, but you can help solve the problem. You can work towards solving the problem. And so POH, part, one part of POH was pollinator gardens. So you can go to the next slide. Another part was looking to bring back plants that were 
we were lacking because of sea level rise or just loss of space where they naturally grow. So we decided to plant sweet grass. So we did that was that there. The kids went in and they planted some sweet grass and we started growing our own sweet grass. I know, I'm not used to having a mic. <laughs> Um, well, we were losing sweet grass in its natural areas because of the sea level rise. And so we decided to work with USGS. No, sorry. NRCS. Um, to plant sweet grass. And so we had the kids come in and do some sweet grass planting. Um, we got the plants from the, the materials plant center in New Jersey um, to try to bring back some plants of cultural significance that we were losing because of sea level rise. Okay, we also got help from the Plant Materials Center with the pollinator gardens. Pollinator gardens, we set up, the kids in camp set up the pollinator gardens so that we could encourage pollinators to come to our farm. Next. The kids did all the spacing and planting. And if we could go back to that very first picture, this is the first garden. One more back. Nope, one more. This is the first garden that that, that picture shows them planting. That garden is still doing really well and, and it's keeping the pollinators around our farm where we're growing things both in the, the open and also and also we're growing them in greenhouses through NRCS and I don't have a picture with this but you can just keep with NRCS we the tribe received two greenhouses 72 by 30 and we're trying to now move towards self-sufficiency as far as being able to have our food available even if things go so far that we this planet can't come back. I'm looking at, I'm 67 years old. I've been here in Mashpee all my life. I'm looking at times when we had a foot and a half of ice on Mastery Wavy Lake and we could race our cars on the pond. Couple of crazies, but okay, <laughs> we got away with that one. But I mean, I'm also looking at a time when we would go down to the pond, go, go down to Sand to a Pond Landing and we would be there for the summer, feeding off natural plants, feeding off fish, and our parents would come down and take a look and see if we were all still alive every now and then. But I mean, it was a different time. I watched water quality go from pure to toxic in my lifetime. Uh, Master Wakeby Lake, you used to be able to drink right out, of the, right out of the lake. Drink right out of the lake. This year I saw it close for the very first time in my 67 years, cyanobacteria. These are things that we need to teach our kids. And when I say our kids, I mean all of our kids. Because these are the challenges. These are the challenges that we're facing now. I mean, it's not going to be, I can fix the problem, or you can fix the problem. If we all don't get busy, Real quick, we're going to have to find a new planet to go to. 
You know what I mean? Maybe that's what they're working towards, but right now, we have definite, definite problems. Send to it, Pond. Send to it, place of the sachem is so toxic at times swimming fishing boating all on a sign saying no don't try it we have one lake in town that is still open and i mean that's questionable as to when that's going to fall so i've been trying to pass on to kids I've been trying to be a teacher like you guys. Follow the lead of my son. <laughs> and pass on the knowledge that I have. Um, by the way, my son is a teacher. He, he taught here in Mashpee years ago, I guess I'll say it. Cause <laughs> but, um, you know, we need to teach our kids that where we're going is wrong. The, and that's the world. That's not just us that's the world and if we don't look at fixing it i don't know what we'll have or how well we'll be able to live should be about it for me huh we're on to our next one which is uh, this is our final panelist here danielle green deer danielle hill green deer works as in various capacities for the tribal folks here in Mashpee, tribal organizations and Native American nonprofits consulted on a variety of indigenous issues. She holds an MPA Sustainable Development from World Learning Graduate Institute. So without further ado, Danielle, come on up. Hi everybody. Great job, we're almost done. No, I'm really happy that uh, Darius is putting this together and I'm happy to be a part of it and thank you for coming. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about food sovereignty. Um, I've been working with tribes, um, nonprofits, different NGOs um, for the last maybe five years um, consulting for food sovereignty issues. So helping different um, tribes define their food sovereignty um, plans and um, help tribal members um, get educated on what food sovereignty is. So um, I also, I'm sure you met Paula earlier today. Um, her and I own the Wampanoag Trading Post and Gallery. Always have to put a plug in for that. So you gotta go check it out at the Mashpee Commons. Um, but my love is food and art, and one day they will merge and cross. But today I want to just um, share with you on why food sovereignty is important. It's a really hot topic right now in Indian country. Um, internationally, it's, it's food sovereignty has been um, well defined and it's a movement that's been happening, but um, tribes right now are really jumping on the bandwagon. and. Um, and their tribal governments are responding to food sovereignty and, and figuring out ways to sort of evolve the movement. So, next slide. You'll leave here today knowing what it is. Um, you'll learn about the context of the food sovereignty movement here in Mashpee for our tribe, um, and, as well as what some other neighboring tribes are doing. And then I will tell you how it's relevant to the school system. I put Mashpee Public School, but I didn't realize that um, we have folks from all over. So this is a very easy um, topic to include in your curriculums. There's a variety of subjects that can absorb this into either one-day lesson plans or you know, um, e even full semesters. Um, I do also provide curriculum development um, services. Uh, I've been writing curriculum for high school students. Um, I also am teaching a, f a course at um, UMass Amherst Stockbridge School of Agriculture this fall um, called Native Food Systems. And then I'm also teaching um, as a guest lecturer at UMass Boston um, for an indigenous women's studies class. So I have lots of practical ways on what you can do with this information. 
So next slide, we're going to just watch a quick video. Um, it's about three minutes in, um, but this um, is taken from YouTube. There's a ton of resources out there with just different tribal members talking about why defining their food system is important. Regaining food sovereignty is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. What is it? A story about food. Story about food? Yeah. Mm. This is a story about food. It's about our relationship with food as indigenous peoples and as all human beings. Buju Chinodenikwe Indigenikas. My name is Simone Senegals. My family is from the Red Lake Nation here in northern Minnesota, and I work at the Indigenous Environmental Network on our food sovereignty program. We all know that Indigenous people suffer disproportionately from health problems such as diabetes and heart disease. But why is this? It's not as though we are naturally unhealthy. And just a few generations ago, these diseases were virtually unknown. And it's not just about personal choice. It's the result of a corporate controlled global food system that values profit over human and ecological health. And it's the result of genocide, colonization, and the disruption of traditional ways of life, language, and culture. Uh, we find that there's a correlation with the issues of environmental and toxic contamination environmental destruction, and it's linked to building sustainable communities. As we started to address the issues of climate change and global warming, we found that based upon looking at our prophecies, looking at traditional stories and having conversation with our spiritual leaders, that the time has come that we have to be very focused on addressing many different issues that confront us today. We need to change our diets. Today it's just heat and serve. These traditional foods were given to us for a reason, because we can go out there and eat it. They'd rather go to McDonald's or Burger King. We're not a very healthy society. All the foods now in the stores with all the preservative has made our people really, really sick, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Our people are dying. Fry bread is not a traditional food. It came with the commodities. Many indigenous peoples are effectively challenging the corporate controlled food system, facing a painful past as well as drawing from the strength and vibrancy of that past to create a healthy future. Hunters and gatherers, gardeners, elders and youth, tribal leadership and community members are taking up their responsibility and exercising their power. Okay, so that was just a snapshot essentially on um, the movement. So yes, it is about food. It's about our relationship with food. But it's also about, if you want to go to the next slide, I can read the, oh, I'll read the definition for you. But it's about tribal governments exercising their sovereignty. And the way that they can do that is enacting policies and tribal laws that not only protect the foods that are sacred and important to them, but um, creating um, these policies where the local municipalities will respect those laws and then it will protect those foods from being contaminated or will protect those waterways from being contaminated. So food sovereignty also goes into the rights of nature movement. Um, so that is also something I'll cover, but essentially there's 576 federally recognized tribes. So there's not just one um, one way or one cookie cutter um, food sovereignty um, movement. Each tribe expresses it a little bit differently, but that's the beauty in it. Um, tribes are able to freely develop and implement um, their own definitions. So they're defining what is important to them and why, and then how they'll come combat um, the issues that are preventing them from being healthy, from being uh, autonomous, from having these laws, from you know creating um, these policies. So it's also cultivating access and secure nutritious, culturally essential food. Um, so the goal is to have people eat healthy and also have people eat their own um, culturally relevant food. So not just going to the farmer's market or going and buying produce, it's about eating the foods that are culturally relevant and historically relevant to them. So when, whatever they define that as, 
Um, it's sourcing those plant and animal beings, and then it's figuring out how to educate their tribal members on where they are, how to harvest them sustainably, but then also if they don't have access to where these plants and animals are, how can these tribes get access to them? Um, so then lastly, designing and maintaining food systems and policies then advance tribal priorities um, for ensuring that tribal citizens have sustenance, that they need to survive and thrive physically, mentally, socially, culturally, not just today, but for the future. So that's why it's food sovereignty. Sovereignty is the big um, golden word um, because tribes are sovereign. So this is another way that tribes can um, enact their sovereign uh, powers and, and sort of empower themselves as a government to take over and control of the fate and the health of their tribal citizens. So let's move to the next slide. So this is a Wordle. I love Wordles. Um, it's a great activity to do in the classroom or in conferences like this. I wanted us to do it together, but it's like a big thing with texting, but essentially um, this wordle was taken from the Blackfeet Nation in Montana. And so as the word gets bigger, it means that everyone has agreed or on that same word. So when they were doing their wordle, wild rice was the most important thing to them. That's why it's the biggest. Um, so to tie this in to, um, the rights of nature movement, um, the, the um, white earth nation, for example, wild rice is very important to them as well. And they're the only tribe so far that has, an, has created a law that protects their wild rice because they have said that it is a being and it, is, and it, and it, it deserves to be respected and protected. Um, and they don't just sort of define it as a commodity or a food source, but that it is, it has rights. And so they have enacted um, this wild rice law into their tribal government. And the beauty of that is that it now forces the local municipalities around them that are polluting the areas where their wild rice is growing, it is preventing them from doing such practices. So that is extremely powerful for tribes to do. So if we decided that Oysters, the oyster being is extremely important to us. And not only do we want to clean the waterways, but it's the oyster itself that we um, think is sacred. I mean, every plant and animal being is sacred, but that it is, it has culturally relevant um, and historical significance to our history, but also it contributes to the health of our people. And we want to enact a law that says, we want to protect the rights of the oyster. So stop polluting and building around these watersheds and these waterways because it's destroying this being. So that's something extremely powerful that attorneys really start to get around. This has never been done before. So that is an arm of the food sovereignty movement that is extremely important. It's not just about food, but it's about the policies around food. And it's, and it's taking out the commodification of these beings. So we're not just talking about food, we're actually talking about the rights of these plant animal beings that we consume as food. So, if we were to have a world, match me was to have a world about food sovereignty, we'd probably have oysters up there, lobsters, you know, um, what else? Cranberries. What? Cranberries. Cranberries. What else? Let's do it with a mom world. Herring. Yes. Sweet grass. Co-ops. Deer. Deer, definitely. Hot Rabbit. Huh? Rabbit. Rabbits. Corn and squash. Corn and squash. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. What? Stumps. 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So that would be our work. So let's go to the next um, slide. So the beauty about our world and being matched to and being on these land is that we've never been displaced. So our foods and what we have consumed has stayed the same, essentially. And that's amazing. And 
relative to our other tribal neighbors, we're pretty healthy over there, um, which is really great. We do eat very healthy So that's good, because we, didn't, we weren't this place, we weren't put out on reservation lands, and we weren't subjected to commodity foods. Um, so that's something that's really special about us. Um, but the other thing about that is that um, it makes us, it's, it um, creates this idea, though, that we, we were the tribe that fed the pilgrims, and that's all we're known for, you know, and that that's all we're, we did. You know, so it kind of keeps us stuck in time, um, but, you know, it's a trade off. But essentially, um, we still want to protect our local foods, we still eat those foods. Um, I'm sure I saw Sherry was on the um, agenda today, and I'm sure she was talking about all the amazing foods that um, she helped to sort of bring forward um, on a culinary level. Um, she inspired me to get into the food side to movement because prior to that, I, you know, I knew of different plants and like boxberries and things that grew, but I never actually thought that I could cook beyond Thanksgiving, that I could cook these meals all the time. It was kind of like a conditioning and a you know, a colonizer mind that I had for a bit. And Sherry sort of drove me out of that when she started to cater to the to the local powerhouse. Like, yeah, I can just drink sassafras tea for no reason. Like it doesn't have to be ceremonial or it doesn't have to be at a special event. I should just be eating all these things all the time. And then I was realizing, oh my God, once I ingest these things, I feel different, I feel better, and it's and it's deepening my relationship with these plants and these animals. So then I sort of went a little bit deeper into figuring out where do they grow, how do they grow, when do I harvest them, sort of, you know, try to challenge myself of how often can I eat like my ancestors. So then that led me down the rabbit hole of like, well, what are we doing on the tribal level to preserve and protect these plant and animal things? So that's how I sort of um, went and just pursued the food sovereignty um, movement and sort of jumped on that. All right. But next slide. So the National Food Sovereignty Movement is very strong. As Chucky alluded to a little bit earlier, as well as um, Chimpy. Um, not only do we have our plants and our animals still around, you know, our, we're still um, harvesting them and fishing and shellfishing. All of our tribal members are very aware of our Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights and actively exercise our hunting and fishing rights. Um, the, the POH camp, even the Wampanoag Language School, has the garden plot definitely um, at the tribal farm. Um, First Night Oysters, of course, was a governmental um, initiative that was also in the food sovereignty um, without even knowing it, we didn't even call it that, it was just something that we did, you know, before food sovereignty became cool. It was like, of course we're going to try to protect our, our oysters and our waterways, that's what we do, but it's nice that there's an actual umbrella right now that tries to sort of help organize their efforts, you know, on, on this um, food um, I also, just this year, just this season, I grew down at the farm just as a tribal member. Um, I asked if I could use the plot, and I grew um, 200 Three Sisters pounds. Um, it came out really well. I was um, gifted these King Philip um, corn seeds. They're red and beautiful. They're April Flint corn. And I felt like it was really special. It was a corn that hasn't been grown on Mama soil for however many millions of years. So I was experimenting with that, and hopefully more tribal members will, will want to grow that corn. Um, hopefully we'll maybe create some ceremonies around that and, and really sort of bring back this, this being into our consciousness and into our diets and into our life and, and sort of honor it just as we do Harry Day or Kumon Day. Um, so that's just me on that level. And those are really two kids. Um, hopefully not many of them will. Just always trying to teach them you know, about the importance and the significance of these plants and just 
touching them, holding them, knowing their names, you know, um, and they're three and five. So it's, I'm, I'm happy that our tribe is um, always invested in youth and teaching them young, and it's, and it's working. So I'm pretty optimistic about the future. So next slide. More about the flu soccer team movement. So there is an Air Vista program um, where uh, these um, volunteers come and they help out at the tribe um, and they learn and they grow. Um, they're down at the farm pretty often. And then they have flu houses right now um, where they're growing. And there's a nutrition program called Lunch and Learn for the Elders. And so most of the produce that they are growing down there is feeding the elders and going to the food pantry. So we are, um, we are, we're doing a great job on a tribal level of growing and attempting to um, create a food economy, a local food economy that we control, that we own, that we know where our seeds are coming from, we know the soil, you know, the food is grown in, and we know who's planting it or who's Who's taking care of it? Because on a spiritual level, it's very important to know where your food comes from. The energy and the love that's been put into it goes right into our bodies, and it's so important that our elders are eating healthy. Um, so I'm really proud of this program and, and the folks that are so sort of running it. Um, next slide. So that is our food, um, our national moment on food um, economy, essentially. And I say economy on purpose because, um, again, it's not something to be taken lightly. Food sovereignty is not just gardening, it's not just permaculture. Like I, I explained, you know, it can be exercised on a cultural level, political level, the spiritual level, um, the social level. Um, and different tribes are doing different things. So the Akunamakana tribe has something similar, um, you know, the herring um, pond is attempting to do something. But you know, the whole chunk tribe out in Wisconsin is doing different things. So that's what we're doing now. It's baby steps, but I think to bring it full circle, um, we need our we need to continue to educate um, the local officials about what our tribal government is doing and why it's important um, to have space and land to grow. Right now the tribal farm is the only place that we are growing out. And it's not big enough to serve our 3,000 members. So we need um, other folks to be aware of our initiatives so that we can acquire more land to, um, to have an agricultural initiative that will be sustainable. Um, we also need this food sovereignty movement, or food sovereignty in general, to be taught in the local classrooms. So having curriculum is extremely important. We need everybody, native and non-native, to understand and to talk about Wampanoag foods or national Wampanoag foods beyond just the Thanksgiving time, when that is It should be talked about seasonally. Um, there should always be a conversation about our food, and we should be eating as local as possible. I know schools have relationships like Cisco, but you know, it's probably not that hard to have some sort of Farm to table programs. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. I will tell you more about some of the suggestions. Um, so let's stop talking about long enough foods on campus. Um, let's create indigenous gardens. Uh, there's no reason why I, I mean, I don't really know what's happening at some of the local schools because my kids are young, but I would hope that. Barnes will actually be found if everybody has some sort of gardening program, gardening club. That's something I feel like that could be easily done or created is an indigenous garden um, or an indigenous gardening club after school, let's say, um, where we're teaching the kids about the pre colonial crops and herbs um, that were grown prior to the arrival of the settlers. Um, so that, of course, can be absorbed into science, health, nutrition, native studies. I mean, there's so many areas where this could just be plopped into the 
the already existing curriculum. Um, again, farm to table program. So it would be really nice if you took the foods from the local gardens at the school on the property or from like our garden or something and had someone to number one educate about um, these foods or these plants. But also um, there should be seasonal uh, recipes um, that the students are eating. So um, I don't know if that's something that exists. I don't think so. And I don't know sort of the rules around that. But it would be so nice if every month there was a culturally relevant dish that the students had an option to eat at lunchtime. I feel like that's really easy. And like, you know, and I don't know if, but like if, if the school can't do that, then at least having a contractor like Sherry or someone come in and just at lunchtime say, this is succotash, and this is what it's made of. And the word succotash means this. And you know, so it's like, those are very easy things to incorporate um, Wampanoag culture into the local school programs. Um, and I feel like everybody loves food. That's a very easy way to transfer this knowledge. You have your attention, you're already eating anyways, try something new. And then, you know, and then we can just have that and be running. So, the native foods class. I took home economics um, in high school. And I cooked cookies, I cooked brownies. So, it's like there are, yeah, like we don't need that. We should be teaching how to cook, um, I don't know, fish cakes. Um, we could be teaching them how to harvest or identify or use some of these herbs for tinctures. Um, I feel like that's something that could be included in the local uh, or in the already established home economics class, maybe one or two recipes to be substituted for Wampanoag recipes, or possibly have as an elective a, a native foods class specifically. And um, again, I've, I've been doing high school curriculum, so I don't know how maybe this could be for elementary students, but I'm sure there's a way. Um, and lastly, just educational materials, um, posters, handouts, see, even if you're not able to provide those foods, just in their packets going home and having a seasonal recipe that they can try at home and then giving them suggestions on where they can source those um, ingredients or foods or herbs or what have you. So those are my things that I was thinking about um, and just easy ways that you guys can go back and just continue this discussion. Um, but food is so important and it's all, it's all around us. Um, and we have the choice to always eat differently or learn different things. It's not like it's fixed. It's not like we can't change. Um, but that's one way that I feel like um, Wampanoag culture can be discussed because there's so many avenues that we can branch off of. Um, so food, I feel like, is always the common denominator. Um, last slide. So with those suggestions and with this um, topic, some of the anticipated outcomes would be, of course, increased knowledge of local foods from the students, from the teachers, um, increased knowledge of Wampanoag history and culture, pride. Um, I know that a lot of our students in the National Wampanoag or in the National School System sometimes feel marginalized and bullied. But if there was um, something that brought the past forward that they could be represented in and not just like part of a tribe that did something 400 years ago, but that they were part of the tribe that's doing something right now, um, today, like this is how we live type of thing. It sort of instills a pride that's relevant, you know, that they can go home and then that can just, that's their, that little seed inside of them that can just grow. Um, they can become their own little um, experts, experts in this area. Um, increase awareness and healthy food choices which will result in local increased healthy eating habits. So we want our kids to eat healthy, of course. We don't want them to always eat that the bag of chips 
is something that they should grab. Maybe they can grab something a little bit healthier. But having having this be taught at home, at POH, um, at school, it's sort of a little bit more all-encompassing when it comes to um, eating habits. Um, incorporation of culturally and locally relevant foods in the school program. School curriculum becomes practical. I know, I'm sure as educators, you guys are tired of stale curriculum. Probably all the school families to make things fun and interesting and engaging. This is in like I said earlier, it's a hot topic, it's new. It's something that they can go home with and just like continue to learn about and do research on. And it's I and mean, other tribes are doing it. So it's, it's, it's in the moment. Um, and lastly, just increased diversity and inclusion leading to less segregation and bullying. Um, I just, I'm always concerned with our tribal kids at school, and this to me is something that they feel good about. And I, I know that younger kids um, like to learn about other, about their friends. You know, what their friends are doing, what their friends are eating. So I just feel like um, it's something that makes us feel good at the end of the day for the kids. So thank you for that. Um, again, I have a company in our hill. I have a website. Um, there's my contact information. I do do consulting. Um, I do do curriculum development, professional development. Um, so if you guys want to continue the conversation, definitely reach out. Thank you so much.